Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. The story, the story takes us to the setting, the time setting around where Jesus has just performed one of his greatest miracles. And that miracle was raising Lazarus from the dead. He was four days in the tomb. And God raised him from that grave. Amen. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. Amen. And of course, Jesus, as his custom was, periodically, he would get away if he could. He would get away and go to Bethany and spend time with the family of Bethany there, which was Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. That's right. And so Jesus wanted to get away for a little bit. And while he was in the process of getting away, taking it easy, because it was just a few days before the Passover, and Jesus knew what he was about to do for the, for the human race. And so he had to prepare his mind. He had to get away for a little bit. But he was invited by a man who he healed from leprosy, who was Simon. And Simon invited, this, invited Jesus to eat dinner with him. And this is where this story takes us. Now let's go to Matthew 26. You should be there by now. Matthew 26, verses 6 through 7. When you have it, please say amen. The word of God says, now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. Now the question is, who was this woman and why did she do what she did? Now, some theologians said that this woman was a prostitute. Now, the word of God, we're going to see is going to show us who this woman really is. Amen. They say it was the same woman who was caught in the act of adultery. If I'm going to show you who this woman is today, right from scripture. Amen. amen. Let's go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. What did I say? John chapter 12, starting at verses 1 through 3. Now, the gospel of Matthew told us that he was in Simon the leper's house. And what city were they in? What town were they in? Bethany, Bethany right? That's right? Okay. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. Now, where were Mary, Martha, and Lazarus residing at? Bethany. Yeah. John 1, verses, I mean, John 12, verses 1 through 3. The word of God says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. So we see right here thus far, linking the accounts together, we see Simon who was healed of leprosy, and then we have Lazarus who was raised from the dead. Amen? Amen. Imagine him sitting one on one side of Jesus, the other on the other side of Jesus. Amen? Let's read on. Verse 2. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So who was the other man sitting at the table? Simon the leper. Amen. Verse 3. Then took, what's her name? Mary, a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. So thus far we see that this woman who had this alabaster box, this expensive spikenard was Mary. Are you with me? That's all right. And her brother was sitting at the table of Jesus. His name was Lazarus. Now, Jesus has just rose Lazarus from the dead. Now, don't you think her heart was grateful to see that her brother is alive again? Amen. She is grateful to the Savior. Amen? Amen. Because when she needed Jesus, he was right there. Now let's go to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. And notice what the word of God says in Luke chapter 7. I'm just linking all these accounts together. The Bible says, precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Amen? We got to compare scripture with scripture. Amen? So you can leave for the day and say, it wasn't my word, it was God's word. Amen? That's what we need to hear today. We hear so much of man's word. What does God say? Go ahead, 
Amen. What does the Bible say? Luke chapter 7. Notice what the Bible says in verse 37 and 38. The Bible says, amen. Then the whole multitude of the country, excuse me, verse chapter 7. <laughs> I'm reading chapter 8. But that's an interesting story also. Luke chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. And it says, and behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. She was a what? Sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with what? Tears and did wipe them with the hairs on the, of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. So in other words, we see this woman was Mary. Her brother had just been, has just rose from the dead by Jesus. And she, the Bible says she was once a great sinner. No, so in other words, she had a testimony. Amen? Amen. Notice what the word of God says about this woman. Mark chapter 16, verse 9. The Bible says, now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast out, what? Seven devils, Luke 8, verse 2, and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Now, the word of God doesn't give us all the details of how she got in this state. But it lets us know that she was once a soldier for the devil. It lets us know that she was deep in sin. And she was, the, she was, her body was the habitations, her mind was the habitations of demons. Seven devils. You know, seven in the Bible means a number of completion. So in other words, she was under the complete control of demonic forces. She had little, seven little demons living inside of her, but she was under com complete control of demonic forces. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how so, how, how, how the encounter with her and Jesus was at first. But it lets us know she had an encounter with Christ. Amen. Now, I can imagine in my mind, in my imagination, looking at other accounts of how Jesus freed people who are under demonic forces. I think of Luke chapter eight, where the Bible talks about this man who had a legion of demons inside of him. And I can imagine this man, he was dwelling among the tombs. Matthew said it was two men. But Luke says it focuses on that one man. But these men, this man was dwelling among the tombs, among the dead. They tried to bound and they tried to keep him in chains and fetters. But oftentimes he would break the chains. The Bible says that the man would be heard at night in the, in, out there in, in the wilderness, in the, in just out there in the middle of the night, crying and wailing, cutting themselves with rocks and stones. Why? Because he was in bondage to sin under the control of demonic forces. And he didn't know how he could be set free, but he heard about a man named Jesus. Go ahead, Doc. Help yourself. How he set the captives free. Yes, sir. And so Jesus and the disciples, they came ashore of the country of the Gadarenes. Jesus had just done a powerful mir miracle in stopping and calming the storm. Now the disciples acted right after, they, when they get off the boat, they see something more fierce than the storm they had previously encountered. Go ahead, they see men who are possessed. The image of God is marred and they look like wild animals. And they come running out ah, like madmen. That's what the Bible calls them demoniacs. They were not just maniacs, they were possessed with demons. That's why they were called demoniacs. And the disciples run off, but Jesus stands still. Puts his hand, now the demons can go no further. The men can go no further. The men see that Jesus is there. The men, they're running out to Jesus because they want to say, Lord, help me. But the demons are speaking through them saying, well, we have, what have we to do with it without Jesus? The son of God. What do you want with? And Jesus said, come out of them. Come on. And the demons left yes. and entered into the swine. Now, I can imagine in my mind that Mary Magdalene's experience was similar to that. Mm -hmm. The demons come out of her. She, was, she, she encountered Jesus. She wanted to say, Lord, help me. But the demons were speaking through her. But Jesus saw 
deep down inside a soul in bondage. And he said, leave her and don't come back. And those demons left. And I can imagine her falling, about to collapse and Jesus catching her and said, everything's going to be all right. And from that day forward, she said, I'm going to commit my life to the one who has set me free. And she said, just like those, those demoniacs, she said, I will follow you wherever you go. Let me come with you. And she did. And the Bible reveals to us that she was among the women who met the necessities of the disciples. Amen. Out of our own pocket, supplying their needs, food, whatever. Amen. Amen. This, uh, her going to the feet of Jesus with her alabaster box wasn't her first time at the feet of Jesus. Go ahead, Go ahead. She had an encounter before. Yes, sir. This woman had an experience. All the other people who were sitting at the table had no clue where Jesus, where Jesus had brought her from. And what was her experience? But see, the thing is, brothers and sisters, whenever God and the Holy Spirit is in a, in a process of doing a work, Satan moves upon somebody to oppose. And so somebody at the table opposed. Who opposed this unselfish act and how did Jesus respond to him? Let's go to Luke chapter 7. We're still in Luke chapter 7, verses 39 through 50. Amen? Amen. Luke chapter 7, verses 39 through 50. There was somebody who opposed, but we're going to show, I'm going to show you as we move on, there was somebody who instigated the whole thing. I'm going to show you. And how he affected the atmosphere of the whole room. I'm going to get on that, but I don't want to rush and get ahead of myself. Luke chapter 7, verses 39 through 50. The Bible says, Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Oftentimes, Satan will arise up through his agents and say, Who does she think she is? Look at her. Does he know, does this preacher know what kind of sins this woman was involved in? How could he allow her to, 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 to do what she's doing right here? How could she be serving in the church when she did all this sin in her past life? But Jesus had already forgiven that person. Amen. Her life has been changed. Amen. Amen. Now, Simon said this within himself. And Simon said, if this man were a prophet, he would have known what type of woman this was. But Jesus revealed himself to be a prophet and more than a prophet, revealed himself to be God because he read the very thought of Simon. And he reads your thoughts. He knows what you are thinking. You can put on the front with God all you want and say, happy Sabbath. How you doing? Put on your nice suit. But deep down inside, what do you really look like? The Bible says all our righteousness is as filthy rags, commoded, nasty, stinking. Notice what the Bible says as we continue on. This is what Jesus said. Verse 40. And Jesus answering him said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two, which had two debtors. The one owed him 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. Simon condemned himself because Simon owed a greater debt than Mary. As a matter of fact, Simon the Pharisee is put by one writer that he was the main person, one of the main, the main person who brought Mary to, the, to, to a sinful state. And he had the audacity to talk about who, if he knew what type of woman this was, he, he, he had the audacity. This is what he was thinking amongst himself. And now he began to see himself in his true light. Oh, man. He began to see that he saw that Jesus could see right through him and see who he really was. And that the act of Mary was truly an act of, his, of her heart of gratitude for him, for what he had did for her. He saw himself in his true light and saw that he should have been the one getting on his knees, washing his feet. 
He should have been the one. Notice what the Bible said. This is what Jesus said. Verse 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered thine house, and thou gave me no water for my feet. But she have washed my feet with tears. You should have gave me, you should have came with a bowl of water and washed my feet. But this woman came re, re, showing true repentance of her sins, and she is washing her my feet with her very tears. And she wiped them with the hairs of her head. You didn't even give me no towel. She used her hair to wipe my feet. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, have not ceased to kiss my feet. My hair with oil. Thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, yes, this woman, she was a great sinner. But I say unto you, her sins, which are many. The Bible doesn't tell us what type of sins she was involved in. Because it was the very sins that she was involved in that got her under the possession of the demonic forces. Because let me tell you something, whenever we willfully reject God's word and his commandments, we place ourselves under the control of demonic forces. And it's only the mercy of God that those who have rejected God's word have not gone under complete control. It's serious, brothers and sisters. And let me tell you something also. Demon being under the possession of a demonic spirit is more than just being all, ah, Jesus, I'm not really, really. It ain't all that. Don't you know that the Pharisees were demonically possessed while standing in the temple all dignified? They were under the control of demons. How do I know that? Because the very Lazarus that Jesus rose from the dead, they said, let us kill him too. They were convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, but they would not be converted. Go ahead, now. Help yourself. They saw all the evidence, but they said, we don't care. You're serious, brothers and sisters. Very serious. Who was this Pharisee? Mark 14, verse 3. And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the what? Leper. Now, one uh, uh, gospel says he was in the house of a what? Pharisee, right? Mm -hmm. So we line, line the gospels together. We see that this man was what? Simon, who was a Pharisee. Same man, amen? So we see that this Pharisee had leprosy. Jesus saved him from a living death. And yet he had the audacity to think in his mind, what kind of man this is to allow this sinful woman to wash his feet? James 5, verses 19 to 20. This is what Jesus did for, for um, Simon the leper. James 5, verses 19 through 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. This is what Jesus did for Simon. What Jesus did, brothers and sisters, we're going to talk about criticism. In your bulletin, I have a quotation talking about criticism. See, there are two types of criticism, brothers and sisters. There is destructive, excuse me, destructive criticism, and there is constructive criticism. Right, Pastor Moss? Yes. What Jesus did for Simon, he gave him constructive criticism to help build him up. Amen. Right. But if you are under the control of the demonic forces, like, like the next person we're going to talk about, who influenced Simon, you are doing destructive criticism. Who influenced Simon and the rest of the disciples? Let's go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. We're going to see the instigator behind this whole thing, brothers and sisters. And we, we're going to, we need to examine ourselves to see if we're like this man. This is very serious. Matthew 26, verses 8 through 9. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. This was one who professed to believe present truth. 
See, oftentimes we want to talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yes, they're doing all this stuff, but guess what? They're even worse. Ones are the ones who profess this high truth. And yet they live on in sin. Matthew 26, verses 8 through 9. Why do I say he was in prison? Truth Is Jesus the way, the truth, and the life? Is, does Jesus ever live right now to make intercession for us? He is presently alive today, and he is the truth. So Jesus, brothers and sisters, is the present truth. And Jesus had a present truth ministry. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? So the disciples, they said, what purpose is this waste? What is she doing wasting this? Why? Notice what the Bible says. For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Mm -hmm. All the disciples said this, but there was one main disciple who said it first and the influence of it spread abroad. Mm -hmm. John chapter 12. Mm -hmm. See, Matthew, he said all the disciples said it. John, he called it the way it was. John pointed him out. You know, y'all not listening to me. John pointed him out. He said, I'm going to tell you who did it. I'm going to tell you who calls all the disciples. Matthew, right? All, all of us said it. But I'm going to tell you who instigated the whole thing. John chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. The Bible says, do we have it? I want you to see who it was. You want to see who it was? Oh, yeah. Notice what the Bible says in John chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. It says, then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, there he is, Simon's son, which should what? Betray him. Have mercy. This is what he said. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Mm, 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 mm. Notice what John says. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the bag and bear that that was put therein. He was the ministry's treasurer. And whenever he the donation was given, a donation was given of a hundred dollars. He would break off. About eighty five put it in his pocket and leave a meager sum for the poor. But but he put it on the front at this feast and saying, this should have been given to the poor. This should have been sold and the money, the proceeds should have been given to the poor. What he was really saying, that that stuff should have been sold so it can be donated to Jesus' present truth ministry so I can handle that money and break me off something so I can get me a new coat. that I saw in the marketplace that cost about 290 pence. And I could still have me a little extra money over. He didn't care about the poor. He was robbing, that's right, Pastor Mo. He was robbing God. The Bible says, thou shalt not what? Still, Judas was a commandment breaker. And remember, for those of you who've been in the seminar, you break one, you have broke what? All. Because guess what? He also broke the first commandment, which is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Money was his God. How do I know that? Because he was willing to steal from Jesus. Mercy. Lord, have mercy. To get his pockets fat. Mercy. All in the name of the gospel. And they're doing the exact same thing today. You see all these different televangelists talking about you, you, you plant a seed of $1,000 and God will give you back $100,000. Lying to the people. Just to get their pockets swole. Then these men are living in the, these big old mansions, having swimming pools in their houses. And I remember an episode of Inside Edition. I'll never forget it. And they was talking about Kenneth Copeland. And they was talking about... Kenneth Copeland, he has his airport and all these different things he has. And I remember the question was asked him by the interviewer. He said, you're supposed to be a minister. Why do you have all this stuff? And he said, you know what? That's none of your business. <laughs> by their fruits, ye shall know them. There are wolves in sheep's clothing, and they're roaming around, roaming around right now. There are Judas's roaming around.
mercy. It's serious, brothers and sisters. Shall we be critical like Simon and Judas? First John chapter three. First John chapter three. Remember, there is constructive criticism and there is destructive criticism. First John chapter three, verses 14 through 16. We have it. Please say amen. Notice what the word of God says, brothers and sisters, in John, first John chapter three, verses 14 through 16. It says, amen. amen. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Amen. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Are you willing to lay down your life for your brother? Judas, by his very comment, was not willing to lay down his life for the one who he was accusing. That's serious. The motive behind destructive criticism is not love, but hatred. And those who hate their brethren, the Bible says you are abiding in death. So in other words, you know what that tells me, Pastor Smith? You don't have eternal life. It's serious. It's serious. Matthew 12, verses 36 to 37. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall what everybody give an account thereof in the day of what? Yes. Judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. What you say to your brother, you'll be justified or condemned by the very words you speak. The Bible talks about love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. It says, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which is love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, can expound on the mark of the beast, can expound on Daniel chapter 2, can expound on the, the, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, can expound on the, the three unclean spirits, can expound on the seven trumpets, expound on the harlot riding on the beast, all these things. But if you have not love, it's nothing. You can lay down your life for this truth and have not love. You're nothing but a fanatical martyr. Because your motive was wrong. You said, I just want a ticket to heaven. You said, I would not die for the one who died for me. But a true martyr said, you know what? I love this truth so much. I love Jesus so much. I will die for him. Just like Peter. Peter, he said, you know what? They was about to crucify him uh, on the cross, just like Jesus was crucified. And he said, you know what? I am not worthy. It's too great an honor for you, to, for you to crucify me the way Jesus was crucified. Put the cross upside down. I'll die that way. He said, I'm, I'm not backing away from this. See, this is a whole entirely different Peter right here. For the, the Peter before was scared. This Peter now wax bold. This Peter said, man, it's too great an honor for me to die like this. Do it upside down. I'm ready to die. Mercy. Are we ready to get, are, are we at that point right now? Are we willing to die for this truth? Are we willing to forsake all that we have for this truth? Are we willing to be talked about for this truth? Because you will be talked about. The Bible says in, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, you should be hated of all nations for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. The Bible says in Matthew 7 verses 1 to 3, judge not that you be not judged. For what judgment you judge, ye shall be judged. And what measure that you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in our brother's eye? But consider it's not the beam that is in our own eye. Or how would thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine own eye, out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thy own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. How can you come to your brother and say, man, how can you be eating all this junk? You know, man, you, you eating all this trans fat and all this other stuff, man. Man, how can you be eating this? 
And that same person that's condemning that person because they're eating the way they're eating is at home eating pork chops. Go ahead, dog. Help yourself. What the Bible says is unclean. Mm -hmm. Help yourself. Mercy. Mm -hmm. Judging how? This is what it means to judge. Luke 6, verse 37. The Bible says, judge not and you shall be not judged. Condemn not and you shall not be what? Condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. So the act, so what Judas was doing there, he was condemning Mary. Condemnation. Condemnation will cause many to be lost. While they're sitting in the very pews of the church. A serious the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent out his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, through Christ, might be saved. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. So if Christ came to save the world and not condemn the world, should we be condemning? Now, brothers and sisters, let me make one thing clear. I'm not talking about calling sin out by its right name. Right. We're not dealing with that. This is different. This is entirely different. And we'll, even when we call out sin by its right name, we got to have the spirit of Christ. Because remember, when Christ gave the woes to the Pharisees and the Sadducees publicly, it was tears in his eyes. He was crying. Why? Because he did everything he could to try to reach out to these leaders, but they rejected him. Acts of the Apostles, page 550, paragraph one says, unbelievers are watching to see if the faith of professed Christians is exerting a sanctifying influence upon their lives. And they are quick to discern the defects in character, the inconsistencies in action. Let Christians not make it possible for the enemy to point to them and say, behold, how these people standing under the banner of Christ hate one another. Mercy. Christians are all members of one family, all children of the same heavenly father and with the same blessed hope of immortality. Very close and tender should be the tie that binds them together. So true. If I preach the truth and you preach the truth. But we're on the two different organizations. You shouldn't point down at me and say you're going to be lost because you're not under my organization. Go ahead, Doc. Make it plain. If we're preaching the same truth, we're on the same team. That's so true. Right. Amen. That's right. What was the what spirit possessed Judas Iscariot? Because mm -hmm. remember, Judas accused Mary. That's interesting. He's going to accuse Mary of robbery, but he himself was a robber, a thief. Mercy. Let's be careful how we talk about us. Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 through 20. Especially those who Jesus is drawing to him. Every time a soul is being drawn to Christ, Satan redoubles his effort to cause that soul to be discouraged and go back into the world of sin. So true. And he tried to do that with Judas Iscariot. That's right. There's far more to fear from within than from without. That's right. There are more Judases in the church than in the world. You better believe. You better believe it. Revelation 12 verses 9 through 10, the Bible says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and the angel was cast out with him. And I, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That's right. It was the spirit of Satan in Judas accusing Mary Magdalene. So true. How do we know that? The Bible talks about Satan entering into Judas right before he betrayed Jesus. Criticism is of Satan and it weakens the church. By giving expression to suspicion, jealousy, and discontent, they yield themselves as instruments to Satan. They think they are gathering for Christ, but in reality, they are scattering from him. So are you a gatherer or are you a scatterer? What are you? What are you, brothers and sisters? How did Jesus respond to Judas's comment? 
John chapter 12. This is how Jesus responded. Now, if Jesus would have openly, strongly, sharply rebuked Judas, that would have been an excuse for Judas to say, because he sharply rebuked me and exposed me, I, I betrayed him. Mm -hmm. But Jesus didn't go that method. He rebuked him, but he did it in a, in a, in a love, in a way of love, and he did it in his, in, while he was commending Mary of her act. Amen? amen. John 12, verses 7 through 8. And we have it say amen. amen. The Bible says, then said Jesus, let her alone. Because what was happening here, Mary was washing the feet of Jesus with her tears and drying them with the hairs on her head. And she was trying not to get too much attention. But when she broke that alabaster box and poured that ointment out, the fragrance filled the whole room. Mm -hmm. And it's just like this. When your life has been changed by the Savior, you can't hide it. Mm -hmm. The sweet fragrance will fill the whole room. The fragrance will, 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 will affect all around you. There's something different about you. What happened to you? There's, your life is no longer the same. Why are you not hanging with us doing the things we do anymore? Go ahead. There's a change. Alabaster that alabaster box was broken. The fragrance filled the room. Go ahead, dog. Break it. And so, Break the box. Simon, he's sitting there, and then Judas, he says, look at this waste. This should be given to the poor. And then the disciples say, yeah, yeah, that don't make no sense. Look at that waist. And then Simon, he's being affected. And he's looking. He has a look on his face. And he's contemplating that thought in his mind. If this man was a prophet, he didn't know what kind of woman this is. And Mary, fearful that Martha, her sister, which would, would rebuke her for doing what she did, and fearful that the, even Jesus would, would have a word to say to her for what she did, she began to silently draw back, trembling. Feeling embarrassed, and that's when Jesus said, "Let her alone." Go ahead, dog. Because Jesus saw what was happening. Yes, sir. He said, "Leave the woman alone." He says, "Against the day of my burying has she kept this." Go ahead, dog. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Mm -hmm. I'm about to die, and none of you, while I'm alive, has showed gratitude to me. Yes, none of you. But this woman, who is very appreciative, I cast out of her seven demons. Come on. Her life was a life of sin. She was a soldier of the devil, and I loosed her from the bands of wickedness. I undo the heavy burdens. I let her go free. And yet you have the audacity to judge this woman. Leave her alone. Leave her alone. You don't know what she's been through. You don't know the encounter I had with her. You don't know uh, in the course we had with one another. You don't know, so be quiet. He said that, but he said it in love. Amen. Mm -hmm. There's a righteous indignation, brothers and sisters. We're not to hate one another, but we have the righteous indignation to sin. Jesus at that moment had a righteous indignation because he saw a soul that was being drawn to him that was appreciative of what Jesus was about to do for her. And yet these individuals who claim to be Christians in the church had the audacity to judge her. Mercy. We talk about winning souls for the kingdom. If we judge in others, brothers and sisters, we won't win one soul. Is there a Judas in the house? What if Jesus stepped foot in this sanctuary? He said, one of you shall betray me. What if he stepped foot in the sanctuary and said, one of you shall betray me? Is there a Judas in the house? Very soon, brothers and sisters, it will be revealed who's the Judas. Mercy. And let me, let me bring this out. What was the result of Judas being rebuked? Matthew chapter 10. Tell me, Matthew chapter 26, verse 10. Matthew chapter 26, verse 10. Where are we going? Matthew 26, verse 10. And we're going to read down to verse 14. I'm going to, see, I'm going to show you what happened. The Bible says in verse 10, when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble ye the woman? For she had brought, wrought a good work upon me. And I can imagine Mary's face lighting up, she, relief coming to her. Amen. Because Jesus had to say this to give her ease of mind because she was starting to be troubled. 
Jesus, he said, let not your heart be troubled. He said it in John chapter 14. He doesn't want his people to be troubled. Whenever you are troubled, you know that there's a demonic force that is troubling you. Jesus didn't come to trouble folk. Jesus came to give people hope, peace, peace of mind, comfort. The Bible says, verse 11, for ye have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she had poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenant with him for thirty pieces of silver. Judas' sin brought him to a point, his sin of covetousness brought him to a point so low that he was willing to sell his Lord chief. 30 pieces of silver. And he had the audacity to tell Mary, look at this great waste. This should have been given to the poor. Mary was using that expensive ointment she bought for Jesus. But Judas sold his Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Make it plain. Cheap. And the Pharisees were willing to buy Jesus rather than accept him freely. The Bible says, Ho everyone that thirsts, according to Isaiah 55, Ho everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters, and he that have no money, come and buy and eat. They could have come and, and, and spent money without price. Yes, sir. Buy bread without price, I should say. But they refused to do, the, do that. But they wanted to buy Jesus for 30 pieces of silver so that they can kill him. Wow. Proverbs 9, verse 8. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. Simon was the wise man who received the rebuke. Judas was the foolish man who afterward hated Jesus. Wow. Mm -hmm. Are you a Judas? Mercy. Are you a Judas? Mercy. That's a sermon. Is there a Judas in the house? Mercy. Are you a Judas? Help yourself. Make it plain. He went to the priest to betray his Lord. Yeah. Said, I will, I, will, I, will, I will do this. I will give him to you for 30 pieces of silver. Are you willing to betray your Lord for your sin? Mercy. Psalm 139 verses 23 to 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me into a way everlasting. We've got to ask God to search our hearts. And see if there's any wicked way in us. Mark chapter 14. What did I say? Mark chapter 14 verses 8 through 9. We have it. Please say amen. Mark chapter 14, verses 8 through 9. Mark 14, verses 8 through 9. What does this act of Mary represent? Mark 14, verses 8 through 9 says this. Amen? So here the page is turning. Mark chapter 14, verses 8 through 9. Amen? It says, she have done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken for a memorial of her. Until the time should be no more, that broken alabaster box will tell the story of what everybody? Abundant love of God for a fallen race. That alabaster box was broken and the fragrance filled the whole room. Who was broken? Jesus was broken. Go ahead, Doc. Make it plain. For our sins. Make it plain. He bled and died. 1 wow. Corinthians 11, verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is what? Broken, broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus was broken. 
so that we can have life. He was broken so that his righteousness, the fragrance of his righteousness can fill the whole earth. And those who embrace it can be saved. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5. Notice what the word of God says here. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5. When you have it, please say amen. amen. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5. We're getting close to the end. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5. Notice what the Bible says. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He had no form, nor comeliness. And we, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Uh -huh. He had no outward beauty. So true. All his beauty was his character. Go ahead, the Bible says he is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Jesus suffered the wrath of God for us. The full wrath of God. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 15 that the wrath of God is the seven last plagues. Mm -hmm. wow. Jesus was wounded in seven places. Wow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He experienced the complete wrath so that you don't have to experience it. And the only way you can escape it is by accepting the free gift of Jesus Christ. That's all right. Because if Jesus did not go through with this, we would have no hope. You know one of the things that strengthened Jesus to go through this trial that he had to go through? It was the act of Mary Magdalene showing her appreciation to what Jesus had done or was about to do. Preach it Amen? Yes. It was that act that strengthened Jesus during the dark trial. Suppose she didn't do it. It was that act that strengthened her. Strengthened him. And he's in the Garden of Gethsemane asking his disciples, his closest disciples, to pray with him and watch one hour, and they've fallen asleep. But it was that very act of Mary Magdalene. He'd never forget. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, notice what the Bible says in verse 11. He shall see to travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He saw you. Sitting in this church, he saw somebody who said, today I'm going to make a full surrender to Jesus and give my all to him. And they made that full surrender today. He saw them. He saw the travail of his soul. I did it just for him. I did it just for her. And he, the Bible says he shall be satisfied. The Bible reveals to us and implies to us that it was all worth it. Just for that one soul. Heaven rejoices over one soul that repented. Why was he broken? Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. That means forgiveness. The only way we could experience forgiveness is that blood had to be shed. And it had to be the blood of the sinless one. And that is Jesus Christ. Yes. Ephesians 5 verse 2 says, And walk in love as Christ hath also loved us and hath given himself for us as offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Yes. The alabaster box that was broken pointed to the Savior. And whenever we say, like Judas, what's the point of this great waste? We're revealing, we're saying, Jesus, what's your worth of even saving me? I'm going to continue on in my sin. Wow. Romans 8, verse 2. 
It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Jesus came. He died. and He was broken so we can be saved from sin and from death. What happens when I'm made free from sin? And what's this Mary's experience? Romans chapter 6. What did I say? Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And also the Bible says in Romans chapter 6. And we're going to look at verses 18. Starting at verse 18. Romans chapter 6 verse 18. We have it. Please say amen. amen. Romans chapter 6 verse 18. Notice what the word of God says. Romans chapter 6 Verse 18, it says, being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. I'm going to skip on down to verse uh, number 20. It says in verse number 20, for when we were, you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become the servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So when we're made free from sin, we become like Mary. We become a servant of the Most High God. Yes. We began to often kneeling at his feet and thanking him and praising him for what he has done for us. Hey Amen. As a servant washes his master's feet, we'll be just like Mary. Okay. Psalm 119 verse 16 says, O Lord, truly I am thy servant, and I am thy servant, the son of thy handmaiden. Why? Thou has loosed my bonds. You have set me free. Why was this her experience? Because of what Jesus had done for her and forgiving her of her sins. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. The Bible says, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God showed his love and demonstrated his love toward us. And that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Amen. And the way we show our love to God. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep, what everybody? My commandments. My commandments. See, oftentimes we miss the point. We think that we just automatically just need to keep the commandments. No, you need to experience the love of Christ first. Amen. You need to see Jesus. Yes, sir. And once you see Jesus and what, and what he has done for you, once you've seen the sacrifice of how he condescended and came here on this earth and lived a perfect life, once you've seen the sacrifice of love, ahead, love will awaken your heart as you see the love of God to you. And as a result, you say, Lord, what will you have me to do? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You say, yes, sir. Go ahead, Doc. Preach. Thank you. Time is running out, brothers and sisters. And time will fail me to talk about a lot of the stuff that's going on. A lot of stuff is going on that many people don't know about. A lot of stuff is going on. And God is calling us to hit the snooze button and awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation near than we believe. It's serious, brothers and sisters. Don't you know right now they're, they're moving toward a cashless society they're trying to anyway? Don't you know right now? <laughs> Have mercy. Don't you, if you only understood, that's why I encourage everyone to come to the meetings. Amen? Amen. Come to these meetings, brothers and sisters. Because you're going to learn some things that you never knew before. Amen? That is so serious. There are things that I want to share with you right now, but I cannot share them right now. But once you understand, we'll be talking about this, this coming week in the meetings. You'll begin to understand what I will tell you very soon. Amen. Amen. But what you need to understand is time is running out. So and what type of people is Jesus coming back for? Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. What type of people? That's right. Ephesians chapter 5. What type of people is Jesus coming back for? Ephesians chapter 5, verses, let's look at verses 25 to 27. Amen? Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. We're coming to a close, brothers and sisters. 
We're getting right here to the close. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? That he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the what? Word. Word. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be a church of criticism. A church that allows LGBT. A church that says, you know what? We're going to be ginger inclusive. Oh, we don't want to hear about that. The Bible says a church that is that is without blemish. It says a church that shall be holy and without blemish. That's what Jesus is looking for. And the question is, do you want to be a part of that number? The Bible says in Revelation 22, verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. So in other words, the Bible is implying to us, it says, if you are not keeping the commandments, you don't have a right to eat of the tree of life. But or to enter into the gates. But the Bible says, blessed are they that do not talk, do his commandments. That they may have a right to the tree of life. I don't know where this comes from, where people say, ministers say, we don't have to keep the commandments of God. The Bible says, in the last book of the Bible, the last chapter in the last book of the Bible says, blessed are they that do his commandments. That they may enter. And the only way we can keep these commandments is by the indwelling of Jesus Christ. Now, during this seminar, we talked about the 490 years prophecy. Now, I'm not going to go into detail with that, but I'm going to read something. This is what the Jews had to do. Seventy weeks are determined upon our people and upon our holy city to finish the transgression. They had to do what? And to what? Make an end of what? Sins. And they, what else they had to do? And make a reconciliation for what? Iniquity. And bring in everlasting what? Righteousness. And to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. They had 490 years to do it. Seventy weeks are determined upon our people. Seventy times seven equals 490 years. We learned that a day in Bible prophecy equals a yeah. year. It's all right if I rehearse a little bit, right? Yeah, that's all right. Repetition deepens their oppression. So in other words, the Jewish people had 490 years. I'm closing on this point, brothers and sisters. The Jewish people had 490 years to get their act together. 490 years for revival and reformation. To make an end of sin. Make reconciliation for iniquity. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Anoint the most holy. In every age, there is given to men their day of light and privilege, a probationary time in which to become reconciled to God. But there is a limit to his grace. Mercy may plead for years and be slighted and rejected. But there comes a time when mercy makes her last plea. But there was one soul, at least one soul. And I talked about another soul last week, Zacchaeus. Don't you know Zacchaeus made reconciliation for iniquity? What did he say? If I cheated anyone, I'm going to restore him back four times as much. Amen. Mary also put an end to her sins. Mary also made reconciliation for iniquity. Amen. During that time where the Jewish people still had time to get their act together, she was one of the ones that said, you know what? I'm going to make a full surrender to Jesus. And the Bible says to anoint the most holy. Now, we know, according to Bible prophecy, we know Jesus. He went into the heavenly sanctuary because there is a heavenly sanctuary in heaven. Amen. After his death, he rose and ascended into the heavenly sanctuary and began his high priestly ministry. Amen. But there is one who is most holy. In his name. Is Jesus and Mary took that oil, broke that alabaster box, and she anointed the most holy. What did she say in that act? I accept Jesus as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and as my future high priest who will intercede on my on my behalf, brothers and sisters. Will God have a people just like Mary who will put away sin and keep his commandments before the close of probation? Revelation 12 verse 17 says, And a dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which do what? Keep the commandments. Did it say trying to keep? Did it say want to keep? 
It Bible says they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. God will have a people. He will have some Mary Magdalene's and Zacchaeus. Brands plucked out of the fire. Men who, and women who were once great sinners. The people who we thought will make it in will not make it in. The people who we didn't think will make it in are going to be the ones who are going to make it in. You may say to yourself, brothers and sisters, I am a great sinner. Yes, you are. But Jesus Christ came to save sinners. The Bible says, as John saw Jesus coming, he said, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. If we would just take our eyes off the world, take our eyes off Donald Trump, take our eyes off a man, take our eyes off the troubles of this world and turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full into his wonderful face and I promise you brothers and sisters the things of this world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace do you want that to be your experience today you don't have to leave the same way you came you can leave differently today Every head bowed and every eye closed. Oh, God is pleading with us, brothers and sisters. There may, may, may be a Mary in this room today. There may be a Zacchaeus or whoever you may be, man or woman, that needs to make a full surrender to Jesus. And God is not asking you to change yourself because you can't change yourself. God is asking you, will you just surrender and let me clean up the filth in your life? That's all you got to do. Just surrender all to Jesus and I will clean you up. Jesus is extending his hand. He's extended the invitation. Probation has not closed. The clock is still ticking, but probation has not closed. His hand is stretched out still, brothers and sisters. Oh, I got to make this appeal because I never know when it's somebody's last opportunity. Who is it? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't care who you are. Nobody in this room, neither myself, have a heaven or hell to put you in. Is there one to say? Yes, Lord. I give my heart to you. Who is it? I ask that you stand to your feet. God is pleading. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you see those who are standing right now. And Father, I am pleading with you that you will keep us from falling. You said in your word, you promised now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. Lord, we're tired of falling. We're tired of stumbling and fumbling. Lord, pick us up, dust us off. Lord, we want to walk right. We're tired of walking crooked. We're tired of walking in the ways of this world, Lord. Help us, save us. We need you now more than we ever needed you before. And Satan, he tries to taunt us. He tries to whisper in our ear and say, you are hopeless. You have no hope. You will never be forgiven. But you are telling us today, you are giving us the hope in your word that you are faithful, God, and that you will forgive us and cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness. Lord, we thank you for the hope. If it wasn't for your word, if it wasn't for these stories in the Bible, like Mary Magdalene, Lord, a ex-soldier of Satan, she had seven demons, and yet you loosed her from the pains of weakness, Lord. Yes. That story amazes me. 
and her love of gratitude is a rebuke to many of us because we don't show enough gratitude to you like we should. So, Lord, forgive us for we've fallen short. Help us, Father. Cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness. And when you come in the clouds of heaven, may none of us in this room be lost. But may we be saved in your kingdom. Keep us near the cross. In Jesus' name. Amen.